Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Omo, and we are continuing our study in the book of Daniel. But before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our sins and that we are controlled by the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity and the privilege we have to study your word. We ask that we'll have open hearts and minds to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's do a little bit of review and get back into our story. Remember that King Belshazzar is ruling over Babylon. The Persian army is outside the city trying to figure out a way to get in. King Belshazzar feels secure and safe in his city with all its fortifications and strong, powerful gates and high and thick walls. And he decides to throw a party. He has his servants bring in the sacred vessels that have been captured from the temple in Jerusalem. And then his guests begin to drink with them and honor their own gods, gold and silver and stone and wood. And while they're doing that, suddenly a hand appears from out of nowhere and begins writing on the wall. After the hand gets done writing, it goes away, leaving some words on the wall that they can see the words, they can see the letters, but they can't figure out what it means. The queen mother comes in and suggests that the king call in old Daniel who used to interpret these types of things for the king's grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel comes in. He begins by reminding the king of how the Most High God had given Nebuchadnezzar his kingship and greatness. Daniel 5.18 O King, the Most High God granted kingship, greatness, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Actually, it's your grandfather. Verse 19, because of the greatness which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, nations, and people of every language feared and trembled before him. Whomever he wanted, he put to death. Whomever he Wanted he let live, whomever he wanted he promoted, whomever he wanted he demoted. So this tells us of the power that Nebuchadnezzar had, the sovereignty he had. Then we looked at the sovereignty of God, how he controls everything, and at the same time, he lets people choose and make choices. Well, Belshazzar, I mean, excuse me, Belshazzar has not been making good choices. So, in God's time and in God's way, it's time for a power shift to take place in the world. Now, let's suppose a moment that you were in Daniel's sandals and you were living in the situation that he was in when we get in the situations where we know there's a crisis about to occur whether it be in our country or maybe even a smaller scale perhaps in our churches or in our home maybe in our city 
It may be a natural disaster like a huge storm, like a hurricane or tornado. Or maybe something man-made that man has done that causes a big change and maybe a lot of people have to suffer. What are the two things that we always do as believers? We continue to tell others about Christ and like Daniel, always be ready to be used by God. Now another thing. When we go through these major shifts, and they don't happen very often in our life, your great-grandparents or maybe your grandparents went through the Depression, some of them went through World War II. Perhaps some of them uh, suffered in the old country and came over to the United States or they are suffering in some way right now. We need to always remember that God is sovereign and that He will take care of us. Don't forget the story that we saw of the fiery furnace and the three friends of Daniel. Their attitude was, well, either God's going to deliver us through this or we're just going to die. But see, when you die, you go to be with the Lord. So it made no difference to them whatever God's will was. And we don't always know God's will in something like that. All we have to do is make sure that we're walking with him and doing what we know is right. Well, Daniel goes on to point out to the king that his choices are not good. That his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had learned the hard way. God took him down, but not out. And Nebuchadnezzar did come back for a short time as king. Daniel then tells why Nebuchadnezzar had to go down and suffer what he did. He had to suffer under the hand of God. Verse 20. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was deposed. That means he was taken off the th throne. That's what depose means. He was deposed from his royal throne and honor was taken away from him. He was driven away from sons of men. That's a way of saying people. And his heart was made like that of an animal and his dwelling place with wild donkeys. He was fed grass, grass like oxen and his body became damp with the dew of the heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind and he sets over it whomever he wishes. So Daniel is telling Belshazzar that his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar got so arrogant and so proud that he forgot God. He forgot who put him there. And then his punishment or his discipline was to be separated from people like a wild animal and put out in the field so that he would get wet just like the other animals do when it rains or there's dew on the ground. He was fed grass like an oxen until he learned who the ruler, who the real most sovereign is. And that is the most high God. Nebuchadnezzar had the power of life and death over people just like Belshazzar.
Well, Nebuchadnezzar got to the point where he realized he needed to turn back to God, and he did. And God let him recover. You know, what's interesting is it describes him as living like an animal. Well, that's because he treated people like animals. He got to be a bad ruler. And then he got to be treated like he treated his people. Notice, though, we see for the first time that it says his dwelling place was with wild donkeys. Now, we didn't see that back in the original story. Now, donkeys back then, just like in our day, is an undisciplined animal. If it doesn't, uh, if it's not kept right, it can be a real problem maker. Kind of like a bad pet. He just doesn't know when to do what he's supposed to do. He barks when he's not supposed to, and he chews on the furniture, and he and he uh, wakes you up at night and does things that you don't want an animal to do. Well, a donkey is, especially outdoors, they can be noisy, they can tear into things, and they can be a lot of problems. So Nebuchadnezzar's lack of disciplined decisions led him to be living with others who had that problem like donkeys. Now, another important thing not to be missed here, and this is what we call underlying the whole story, is that God had moved his remnant. That means his selected group of believers from Judah to Babylon. So Babylon was the safe place for God's people to be. And for them to be safe, God had to have, or they had to have, I should say, a good, decent ruler over them. One who didn't ruin their families or, or, ruin, or try to ruin their religion or ruin their lives. Because you see, God was going to have thousands of these people who have been taken captive. It's going to be their children and grandchildren move back to Judah in just a few years. In fact, it'll start at this point in the story, within a year. So these clear words from Daniel are a strong warning and a rebuke to King Belshazzar. So Daniel goes back and reminds him of his grandfather, and now he's going to turn to Belshazzar and tell Belshazzar, the king, what he's doing wrong. Daniel 5.22 Yet you, his grandson Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. So Daniel tells the king he hasn't humbled his heart either. That was the problem with Nebuchadnezzar. Remember back in verse 20, when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud? Pride and arrogance is the opposite of humility. And Daniel reminds them that he knew all of this about his grandfather and what had happened to him. But you see, when you get so arrogant, you get so proud, you just don't think you're going to be like the other person that failed. You're too smart for that, you see. Or you know so much, you're not going to make those same mistakes. But Belshazzar was. He knew how Nebuchadnezzar lost his kingship. And he was doing the same thing. And Daniel 
makes that clear to him. Now, this is like someone being accused of something like he's receiving the charges before him of what he's done wrong. Verse 23. Instead of being humble, verse 23, instead you have exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven. You brought before you the vessels from his temple and you and your nobles together with your wives and concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone They can that cannot see or hear or understand. But the God in whose hand is your breath in all your ways you have not glorified. Well, let's look at this big, long verse for a moment. Daniel points out that Belshazzar knew exactly what he was doing. He knew he was going against the Lord of Heaven. He knew that he had taken these sacred drinking vessels and partied with them and was drinking wine from them while he and his guests praised their pagan gods. And Daniel calls these gods for what they are. Gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. That means they're made of this. That's all they are. If you have a god that's shaped like a piece of wood, all it is is a piece of wood. It can't see or hear or understand anything you say to it. It doesn't even have a mind can't even hear you. At the end of that verse, Daniel says, but the God in whose hand is your breath. You see, Belshazzar couldn't even breathe if it wasn't for God. He also says, in all your ways you have not glorified God. You see, arrogant, proud leaders often do just the opposite of what they should be doing. They honor those things that should not be honored, and they dishonor those things that should be honored. Belshazzar's life, his ways, his what we might call destiny, are in the hand of God, and now a hand from God writes this inscription on the wall. Verse 24, Then the hand was sent from him, that's the God that has given him breath. And this writing was inscribed. I'm just going to write the translation here. Mene. Mene Tekel Oop Farson Oop Farson. Now these are Aramaic words. Remember, this part of Daniel was written in Aramaic. Now these words could be used for different things. They could have different meanings. A mene is actually a mina. 
that's a measurement of silver or heavy weight now I know you don't know what a shekel is but just to let you know it's 60 Babylon or Babylonian shekels a tekel is another term for money it's equal to a shekel that's the Hebrew term so it's silver and gold okay it's a weight of silver and gold <clears throat> this word right here pronounced uh, vu or v that's actually the word for and and then farson a farson that means divided or in this case half of a tekel or what we would call a shekel. Now, this is kind of hard to follow, <clears throat> but let me explain to you. In the Aramaic language, the word mene can also mean something weighed. It also can mean something measured, measured and weighed. Okay? And tekel's similar also. And this farson, as we said, it can mean divided or it can mean in half because it means to be divided in half. Now we have English words that have two different meanings, don't we? You know, if I was to say something's cool, you could say, well, it means that the weather means, that means its temperature is cool, or maybe you just like the way it looks. All right? Well, these words had two different meanings. And as the banquet crowd looked at them, they were puzzled what this meant. They may have taken it, and they probably did, taken it for the money meaning. Like, <clears throat> like, mene, it has to do with dollars, and then we say, say dollars and cents, okay? And then it's divided. And that doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense to them either. But when Daniel came in, he's going to tell them what it means. It's not the money interpretation. Okay, it's not this interpretation. It's going to be this interpretation. So, Oh, there's one other word this can mean. It can mean numbered, like you count something, okay? So we would have, let's do it this way. <clears throat> We're going to do it Daniel's interpretation now, okay? It's going to be like, remember, these are the same two words. So it could be numbered or measured, like you count something. And it could be weighed. That's what you would do to weigh the value of gold or silver. And then he's going to say divided. So Daniel comes in. And look at his interpretation. I'm going to put it on the board for you. Numbered, measured, weighed for what it's worth. And separated from the ruler. Now, we still don't know a whole lot what this means, but we're getting a little clearer picture. And as Daniel breaks this down in the next few verses, he's going to describe 
that the kingdom has been weighed and valued and it's going to be separated from the ruler. So, Belshazzar's kingdom will be divided from him and given over to the Medes and Persians. Now, we call them Medes and Persians. That was actually uh, the two people that came together and formed the Persian army now. You'll hear the name Medes and Persian or Medio Persian Empire. It's the same thing as just the Persians. Cyrus is the king of Persia. We'll talk about him in a little bit. All right, verse 26 Daniel begins to look at the individual words and tells us what they mean. This is the interpretation of the words. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and brought it to an end. Well, that's pretty simple to understand now. When it's brought to an end, that means it's over with, it's complete. And notice he says, your kingdom the kingdom itself is done with. Its time is up. We use the expression today, its days are numbered. That is the case for the kingdom here. Babylon is ending. Terminated. So, Mene had to do with the kingdom. Numbered, numbered, or numbered and measured, however you want to say it. Its days are up. Verse 27. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found lacking. Remember, the word tekel also means weighed. So in 527 we see that Tekel is addressing the king when it says, you have been weighed on the scales. Remember verse 26 had to do with the kingdom. Now verse 27 has to do with the king. The next word We actually have to use more of the, we're going to talk about Eupharson. The word is really, and I know this is in Aramaic and it's hard to follow. He takes the word peres. That's the same thing as farson, but he's using it as the verb in this translation. Your kingdom has been divided, so the word means divided, and given over to the Medes and the Persians. So the king, the kingdom has been divided. By that he means it's been separated from you and given over to the Medes and the Persians. Well, that was the interpretation. Look at Belshazzar's response. Then Belshazzar gave orders and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and they proclaimed him to be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now remember Daniel had said he didn't want these rewards. But the king had the rewards given to him anyway. There was no point in resisting what the king wanted to do because it was all going to be over with in a short time anyway. Daniel was proclaimed third ruler in the kingdom behind Nabonidus and Belshazzar. But look at verse 30. In that same night, 
Belshazzar, the Chaldean king. Remember, Chaldean's an old term meaning it's for the same thing as Babylon. He was slain. He was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom at 62. That means at 62 years old. Let me get verse 31 up there. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom at 62. So this tells us that King Belshazzar was killed that same night. And then another ruler was placed over Babylon. Let me explain. <clears throat> we have Babylon. And we have Persia. The ruler of Persia was Cyrus the Great. That's what his name became. He was a king. But he ruled over Persia, which was much bigger than Babylon. Okay? But it included Babylon. So, <clears throat> this is actually Persia. Ruled by the king. And he put another man by the name of Darius the Mede in charge. It's much like having Nabonidus the king over Babylon <clears throat> and him putting his son Belshazzar in charge of the city and its area, you see? So that's who Darius the Mede is. He's a man that Cyrus the Great, the king, put in charge of Babylon. So the government of Babylon, that area, was turned over to Darius the Mede. Now, I told you earlier how the Persians got into the city. The river that ran under the walls, remember that? They cut off the water. Let's say, again, that this was a city. The, the river that ran into the city, instead of going into the city, it was diverted out, so the, the river bed underneath dried up. Okay, so it dried up, and they went in under the walls. The soldiers went in under the walls, and they took down the guards and captured the city. There's some historians that weren't even believers that wrote about this in ancient times. I'll mention their names. One was Herodotus, and the other one's name was Xenophon. Those are both Greek historians. In fact, uh, Xenophon was also a military man. So he knew about strategy and tactics, and he probably described it from the viewpoint of a soldier. Now, let me just remind you of something we saw back in Daniel chapter 2. Remember the big statue that Nebuchadnezzar had in his vision? Remember that it had a head of gold? Do you remember that? And then when it got down to the shoulders and arms, I don't have the cover silver here. I don't have the color silver. But when we get down to the shoulder and arms, it's silver. Well, this is the silver part. This is Persia. Medial Persia, remember? Same thing. So it's happened. It's happened in Daniel's lifetime. 
Now I want to show you one more thing. This was Babylon. It covered a pretty good area, didn't it? Let's look at Persia. Even more, huh? Much bigger. Well, that is the end of this chapter. So at the end of this chapter, we have Persia taking over Babylon. And that'll get us ready for chapter 6 in our next lesson. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word. Thank you for the history that we have recorded so we can see how you worked in the lives of the world leaders and moved nations and changed powers and how you used people like Daniel. Lord, we ask that we'll be aware of what's going on and at the same time be ready to be used by you just like Daniel. In Jesus' name, amen.